Welcome to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Joshua T. Berglund, and this is the very first broadcast uh, that I've done in over six months. So it's only fitting that we come back with a new show, a new format, and I believe something that's going to be way more interesting, way more fun, and also really highlight our guests uh, in ways that I don't believe that guests have been highlighted before on other broadcasts. These 21 questions are from all over the place. Now, they're very intentional. However, it's meant to get into the deepest parts of people's hearts, also to understand their vision, what they are about, where they're going, unique challenges. But also, these questions are fun and interesting and not boring. Now, in my previous broadcast, where it was all about putting a spotlight on shadow worlds and uncovering trauma, we'll do some of that, but it's going to happen organically instead of being forced. This is supposed to be a fun, lighthearted, but also authentic and real conversation to get to know who our guests really are, hence unmasking. And this is not to suggest that my guests wear, wear a mask, but at some point in our lives, we've all worn a mask. And at some point, well, we don't always showcase all sides of herself to the world. And in the spirit of the world that I believe is to come where there is no secrets. In fact, all that is hidden will be revealed, in my opinion, and other people's opinion. And anyway, won't spend too much time there. But I believe that it is time to show who we are in the most authentic ways possible. And while these questions are scripted, they are carefully crafted, crafted to be able to do that. I want to get the best out of my guest and also get the best out of me. Now, one of the things that some of you all know of is that I've been dealing with tremors the last six months, and that's why I haven't been broadcasting. And as you just saw, the minute that my eyes break focus off of staring at that camera lens, I will tremor. So you will see me with a blue ball, a blue spike ball in my hand during this broadcast, and that's to help me be able to ask questions and then also receive the answers without shaking my head all over the place, because that's what happens. <laughs> it's not a lot of fun. But that said, uh, this is how I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with this. And so instead of it being a conversational flow, 21 set and specific questions. But again, I believe that this is going to get the most value out of the guest for you to enjoy. Thank you for being here. And before I continue, um, before we introduce our guest, I want to say this. I want to give a shout out to DLT Valley. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing for people all over the world uh, who are disabled. And you're giving them the tools that are necessary for the fourth industrial revolution what you're doing in educating uh, the blockchain technology and how we can all benefit from it and how we can all use this in a way that empowers us regardless if you're disabled you're able-bodied you're able mentally you the work that you're doing is so important and it's going to absolutely transform um communities all over the world. And I've already seen it firsthand over the last few weeks uh, behind the scenes, getting to see the education that you're providing for others. And for me, it's a big deal. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm excited to learn more. And I'm also excited to be the blockchain community manager uh, for your organization now. And it's a real blessing for me. We are all about elevating the voices for the voiceless. We are all about being a voice for the voiceless. But the other part of our mission at the World's Mayor Experience and anyone that I associate with and affiliate with, all of these amazing organizations like Miss Jess VR uh, and, and Think and Grow Big, and just there's just amazing, amazing communities and ecosystems around the world that we've been able to work with. And it's so exciting because now is the time for the meek to rise. Now is the time for people that have been underserved to really take their destiny in their own hands and make their dreams come true, to do what their creator created them to do. And regardless of disability, regardless of mental illness or, or you know, socioeconomic background or religion or gender or any of that stuff, now is the time for the underserved, the voiceless to rise. 
And um, we are so passionate on this platform about doing that or being a part of it and playing our role. And so the stories that we tell and the guests that we have on, like our guest Ferris today, uh, who is an absolute, you know, one of the more interesting people I've ever met and his background, and I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio because he has an expertise of unlike anyone I've worked with in the past. Uh, he has spent over 20 years delivering strategic change for the corporate and non-corporate worlds. He's been a top tier strategy consultant, a non-exec director, an educator, and an in-house strategist. But he has experienced firsthand the fine differences between strategic success and failure. And we're going to get into that today. We're going to have a powerful conversation. These questions are awesome. Our guest is amazing. Uh, he is just influences people all over the world to make radical change in their life. And I am absolutely honored to introduce to you our guest, Ferris. Ferris, welcome to Unmasking Human. <clears throat> Ferris, welcome to Unmasking Humanity. Twenty-one questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I am absolutely honored to have you here, especially with as patient as you've been in getting this done. Uh, but it means a lot to me, not, not only that you were patient, but that you were able uh, or you were willing to come back on and actually do this interview in a much different format than <laughs> is normal. So thank you for being here. And before we get into everything, I would love to ask you just to set the tone for this broadcast. What are you grateful for today and why? Hey, I'm going to just carry on the theme you said. I am so grateful we're doing this broadcast. We're doing this interview uh, because not only because it gives me a chance to to uh, talk to you, uh, share some uh, funny stories with the listeners, but it's a completely new format. Uh, I love meeting new people, doing new stuff. So super grateful to be your first guest on this new format. Thank you so much for being here. So you ready for the first question? I am. Hit me. All right. If Shia Ghetto, your amazing organization, were a superhero, what would be its superpower? Uh, do you know what? It's it's a superpower that you don't read in any of the Marvel comics. It's the ability to become friends with absolutely everyone, right? It doesn't matter, right? Donald Trump, uh, Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un. I would imagine Shia Ghetto, the superhero, would just have this ability to be everyone's best friend. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> Such a fun answer. Um, tell us about a time when combining IQ, EQ, and FQ felt like mixing a perfect cocktail for success. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a great description. Perfect cocktail. I'll tell you a time uh, of uh, working with one of my clients, right, where the um, the challenge was that the teams were just not getting on. So a bunch of super IQ people, they had the right answers, but they just didn't like each other, right? Uh, you know, lacking the EQ and lacking even the awareness that they didn't like each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we could do as a team was go in there and create the bonds, create the ability to see each other as a human being, right? So that they could share their IQ. Right? And uh, we did that in a focused way. And it, 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 we couldn't leave it to just chance that they'd get on. And so one of the techniques I used was gamifying everything, uh, Joshua, turning everything into a game because they all loved a game. They all loved winning. What they didn't realize was the actual real prize to be won in the game was getting to know each other, not the not the simple you know dynamics of the game that they thought they were playing. So uh, that's just a classic example of how we can blend IQ, EQ, and FQ to get really great results with the teams we work with. You've got some great questions, Joshua. <laughs> Thank you. In the spirit of uh, being authentic and honest, my plan was to start and stop each question. However, I'm finding that it's more disruptive for me to do that. And so I'm going to rely on what I've talked about in some of my videos in the blue ball. So we're going to keep this going. And Ferris, I want to acknowledge you for your patience as I get through this because I love this conversation I or I love your answers, love the questions, but I want to keep a more of a healthy flow with you because I'm just enjoying it so much and the start and stop is just a momentum killer. So I'm going to expose myself a little bit of what I was trying to do behind the scenes and make it easier, but now we're just going to go with the flow and move forward. 
I'm going to read my questions to you and we're going to have a conversation. So I've already shifted my format five minutes into it, but are you cool with the change, Ferris? I'm cool with the change. You know, it's the old, Mike <laughs> the old saying, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's what Mike Tyson used to say. So, And, it, and you know what? He's right. He's right <laughs> because I've had plans in life and I've gotten punched in the face for those plans. But I'll tell you what, it also is a great way of testing how sure your purpose is and how sure you are of what you're doing. Like how bad do you really want it? Yeah. Those punches in the face. Do you want that heavyweight title or do yeah. you want to go down like Spinks? I want the title. So we're going to do this. We're so do this. question number three in 21 questions with Josh yeah. with Berglund. What's the wildest industry specific challenge you faced and how did you tame it? Well, so a lot of your listeners won't know, I, I've been a strategy consultant for 17 years, so I've done some wild projects in some wild industries, right? Uh, and uh, the one I'm going to pick, funny enough, is pandemic flu, right? But not the pandemic we just had, right? I, in 2008 and 2009, I spent 18 months of my life working on pandemic flu preparedness for the UK government. They said, what if we get hit by a pandemic? We need to be ready. And in 2009, halfway through, we were building the systems swine flu hit the world and they thought this is the pandemic let's launch everything and we told them we haven't even finished building stuff and they're like just launch 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 right so it was such a wild and crazy time and me being an economist by training i was tasked with one other person to work out how do we secure the most vaccine back then in 2009 possible when there's only one company in the world that claims they can make it and such a crazy question to lob at me you know, and this other guy. And um, we had to sit in a room. We had 24 hours. Made by, we ne didn't go home that 24 hours. And we designed a war game, uh, Joshua. We designed a war game which uh, played out what happens if we are bidding against other countries around the world for this one supply of vaccine. How do we win that game? And then we played it with senior people in the government. And uh, it was... It's crazy wild. I still remember it now, sat in that room, um, but uh, subsequently even more pressing when what happened sort of uh, 11 years later. Oh, my gosh. Okay, this is not – man, see, do I, I have these set questions, and I'm going to ruin my theme of my show because I already have follow-up questions, Dead it. Yeah. We're sticking to this script, though. Okay. Um, but I love, I love your answers because they just stimulate – so much more thought and i'm like i want to know more <laughs> like uh, please tell me you have a book on this but question four yeah if a company's culture were a recipe how would you adjust your strategy to be the perfect seasoning okay do you know what uh, I, I love a question and i love a metaphor i use a lot of them and analogies um and actually i'm gonna i'm gonna reply with a little bit of a story right when i was a kid my mom is an amazing cook like everyone's mom but she wanted to teach us how to cook right and one of the dishes she makes is hummus right you probably have tried some hummus it's a great dish it's actually only made of four ingredients right mm. it's very simple to make but it's easy to get wrong that's what my mom would always tell us right so when we were kids she taught us to cook by making bad hummus something would be wrong with it and she'd give us a spoon of it and say what's wrong with it how do we fix it it's you've only got four ingredients so which ingredient do we have to put in if it's too runny you add more tahini all right if it's too lemony right you add more chickpea yeah yeah so there's she taught us that every bad recipe can be fixed with some simple additions so you know so if uh, if uh, you know culture was a recipe what would we be doing we'd be looking for the simplest way back and it might just be adding a bit of salt Right. It might just be adding a bit of a e little bit of EQ, right? A little bit of more connection in the team. It might be adding a bit more chickpeas, which is adding some better ideas into the team. Right. It might be adding some more focus, which might be adding some more lemon juice into the thing. So I always take it back to those lessons when I was six or seven with my mum in the kitchen teaching me how to cook without me realizing that's what uh, I think would do for culture. Wow. That is such. A great answer. Oh my gosh. I, I'm so glad that these questions are flowing with your personality so well because I like it's just a beautiful answer. Like I'm like getting to know how your mind works at the same time. So I'm really loving this. So all right, question five. How does yeah. focus quotient transform yeah. strategy execution? 
paint us a before and after picture. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so now for those of you who are listening, might not have heard of focus quotient, right? This is what we say is one of those missing ingredients uh, to be really successful and have a successful strategy. So let me, let, let me give you, I often use an example of me trying to get fit, mm. right? I want to get fit. I want to lose weight, right? I need to have some great ideas for how to lose weight. And it might be, you know what? I'm going to go to the gym four times a week, right? Mm -hmm. That's my great idea. I pick it out of all the others. It's, yeah. Then the emotional side, the emotional question is, I'm going to tell all my friends, right? Get them on board because it's so hard to do something on your own, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, maybe one of my friends says, I'll be your gym buddy, right? Now, what's missing is that's not enough, right? Without the focus quotient, Without actually saying, do you know what? This is so important to my life. I'm going to restructure things. I'm going to, you know, set my alarm an hour earlier, get up in the morning. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of change my, you know, things in my way to make sure that I do go to the gym four times a week, right? Because that's the component of how you apply focus quotient to make a strategy a success. Too many people forget that element and just go, well, I've got a great idea. I've got my friends involved or the, the team involved. But if you're not having that focus and dedication, it's going to fall apart. It's interesting. This ball has been a, uh, a metaphor and symbolic and foreshadow and everything else for so many things that in my life um, centered around focus and where my energy goes. Yeah. And uh, I, I just I really love that answer because it applies to my life in real time. And uh, I just really appreciate that answer. Question six. Yes, sir. Imagine IQ, EQ, and FQ as characters in a sitcom. How does Shia Ghetto help companies direct the show? Uh, okay. How they, first of all, we help um, make sure we cast the right people in each of those uh, your characters, right? Uh, we make sure that uh, the scripts are, are top draw, right? But most crucially, we ensure each of the characters have an equal amount of airtime, mm. right? Think of your favorite sitcom, right? Cheers wasn't great because we just focused on Sam. Friends wasn't great because we just had, you know, 100% Joey. You need that balance. But do you know what? Sometimes if you're a director and you've got a favorite, you accidentally put too much, yeah? and and that, yeah, it wouldn't be a great show if there was too much Ross, right? You need the other characters. So one of the things that we would do to make sure it's the best sitcom ever is make sure there's equal screen time across the series. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. I, I remember when putting these questions together, I'm going, I'm going to get some good answers, but <laughs> I didn't know I was going to get these answers. This is amazing. Because it's not like these are easy. You have to think. Think. I, I just love how you're able to do this. All right, number seven. <laughs> this one's great, too. I'm not complimenting my own questions. Here, share a mission impossible moment where your team saved a client from strategic disaster. Oh, okay. Uh, mission impossible. Um, there's been a few, but uh, I tell you what, I'm thinking of I went, we went into a company once that was under severe distress uh, in terms of shareholders and uh, needing to make it turn things around in terms of how much money it was making. And uh, I sat down with this, this CEO and she told me the problem and she said to me, Faris, you've got two weeks to come up with a plan. I said, fine, give me two weeks. Two days later, she pulled me into the same room and said, I don't have two weeks anymore. What's your plan? And I said to her, well, I, 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 I thought I had two weeks, but I tell you what, here's what we should do instantly. I said to her, I want to get everyone in and train them how to run a meeting. And she said, what the hell is that going to do for me? <laughs> or what, why you pick that? I thought you'd come up with a new product, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new marketing campaign. I said, no, have you been in any meetings in this company? They are chaotic, right? People turn up late. People just sit around. Nobody makes any notes. Nobody knows what the, why there's the meeting. All right? You might as well not have them. And she said, okay, I agree with you, but how's that going to improve my sales position? I said, trust me give, me, give me a week to train people. So I trained everyone in that company how to run meetings. And you know what happened? 
sales performance went up by one and a half percent right? and she was flabbergasted she was like what's your next idea I, first of all she was like i don't know what you just did but she's like what's your next idea right and by that time i had a couple more ideas and the team had come up with some more ideas so step by step we were able to make the small changes by putting some more focus fq and some structure right and getting people working better together the more eq to save that company from what would have been a really really bad year number eight wow yes sir <laughs> if you could time travel your strategies into the future okay what safeguards would you put in place uh do you know what i love about the future about the past is but is also a challenge is human beings forget a lot yeah we forget what great i and we're arrogant right we forget what great ideas people had in the past and we kind of belittle them and say well we're cleverer now we won't make those mistakes again but you know what we're not that much cleverer and we do make those mistakes over and over again and forget other human beings you do it to yourself i'm amazed at how many times i go back over my own thinking and think oh i'm a better thinker now but actually i'm pretty impressed by you know 20 year old faris and the decisions he made or or 30 year old faris and the decisions he made so you know what i would do in terms of time travel is sort of go back and forth in time and say trust the other generations right they've got some great content they've got some great ideas right you don't need to do all the heavy lifting and, th and, and think you are the superhero of every story and i think that would put us in a in a much better place to listen more explore what's come before us um, before just start you know throwing it all out of the uh, the bath water with the baby or the other way around so beautiful i i and i agree with this too and i i'm going to add i want to add something to this because i feel led you know where we're faced right now where we have a lot of futurists that have seen the future and know where we're going or believe where we're going because they've studied what was you know the the people that create the plans for the world they've studied what they're saying and what we need to know and the information and so we have people that have studied the singularity the fourth industrial revolution the future tech the you know agi all of these things that are out there that are available for us and all of it's great and exciting because there's so many opportunities there but the problem I see with a lot of the, the younger generation and the creators is they're just solely relying on the tools of the future without understanding the foundational pieces to make it all work. And sometimes those foundational pieces are found in the old way of doing things. And mind you, I'm all for progression, but the yeah. old way of doing things had really solid roots for a reason because there was foundational principles there that mattered. And mind you, yes, we evolve and yes, we change. But like I look to editor people that edit and, pe and producers and, and even actors and people that are cinematographers, it's really easy to go put in a prompt to create something. However, yeah. without really knowing the history and the backbone and how all things work, without that education, I don't really feel that that future generation is going to go as far as they're wanting to without being able to learn from the old school too and there's a lot of different examples of that but i'm seeing this and in a way it makes me nervous and i don't think it's time to forget our elders because there's a lot of wisdom there and frankly uh we can learn a lot from them and as far as myself i can also look and learn learn a lot from the younger generation as well about how to do things like we all need each other and just because somebody's older or younger doesn't mean that there's wisdom or something to be learned from them so i really really love your answer and i just wanted to add that thank you sir so number nine yes all right how has your career journey been like assembling the ultimate strategy avengers team ah oh. <laughs> uh do you know what um by it, it has been the perfect uh you know avengers team and do you know what there's still some spaces to add to the team right but uh i didn't realize i was creating an avengers team uh for strategic success while i was doing it you know just for the the benefit of the listeners viewers my career started as a high school teacher i used to teach high school economics and maths 
and I toured around the world. You know, I lived in Latin America, I lived in South Asia, I lived in the Middle East, I lived and taught back in the UK. But then I decided to make a switch and I moved into the business world um, and I joined an energy company. And I had to start again. I had to start on the shop floor. So uh, I, I was considerably older than everyone else, but that was fine with me, right? And uh, that took me into the world of strategy. I ended up in their corporate strategy team. From there, I got approached to join strategy consulting. So then became a new chapter. You know, how do you, how do you help others with their strategy when you're an outsider? Right? And I spent 12 years doing that. And then five years ago, I started my own company. And again, a whole new challenge. How do you how do you sell your services? How do you grow a business? How do you grow a team? But each of those experiences, and by the way, there's some experiences I haven't talked about. I, I tried my hand as a journalist. I worked for the police for a while. You know, I love variety and embracing new challenges, but all of those are an Avenger. Each of those skills, the ability to stand in front of kids, the ability to work your way and understand a complex market when I worked for an energy company, the ability to help client, all of those is a different Avenger which have gone together to make the, the you know, the team that I have now. Uh, and I'm so grateful for it. Number 10, mm. what's the secret ingredient in your work yes. that, that makes you jump out of bed every morning? The secret ingredient apart from a weak bladder. That's a bad joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <it makes> really... <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> Same thing. Guilty. Dad uh, gummit. I think gentle. Aging sucks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can either see it as a weakness or a strength, right? Yeah, I guess yeah, you have to leaves you up. Uh, I have a free uh, alarm uh, clock. What do you want? It's an me? alarm clock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the secret ingredient is that I'm not done yet right i'm not done in learning i'm not done in uh meeting new people i'm not done in the impact i'm gonna have in the world right and i think that was a itch that <clears throat> first lit in me when i became a school teacher helping individual students get stuff that they didn't get before change the the, the trajectory of their life i love doing that um and that's been an arc throughout everything i've done and i'm not done with that yet i want more of that and that gets me out of bed in the morning Gosh, such a good answer. Number 11. Yeah. If the story of Shia Ghetto were a yeah. movie, yeah. what would be its tagline? Well, I mean, Shia Ghetto's tagline is sharpening your effectiveness. So, uh, you know, it's got to be this summer, get sharper with Shia Ghetto. There you go. Number 12. Describe a time when IQ, EQ, and FQ came together like a strategic Voltron. <laughs> um, <laughs> who wrote these questions, Joshua? Uh, I, I went in La La Land last night, and <laughs> yeah, was... let me just check a Voltron. Uh, which TV show is that from? Or you don't remember Voltron? Oh, hold on. So, like, think of like. Like the perfect synergy of awesomeness, of self-mastery. Like think of something um, like uh, describe a time when IQ, EQ, and FQ came yeah. together. Just like it was a strategic plan of mastery where you're having to apply all of these pieces to come together to form the perfect thing, the perfect superhero, the perfect warrior. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, I've just Googled it as, we, as we've been speaking. It sounds like Transformers, right? Yeah. Basically. He uh, means... <laughs> yeah, yeah. A poor man's a poor man's transformers or a rich man's transformers, depending on uh, which side of the divide you're on. There you go. Um, so how how do they create the perfect uh, Voltron, perfect transformer? I think it's uh, you know it is that symbiosis uh, um, of bringing those three elements. Right. None of them take um, uh, none of them take precedent over the others. Right. So they're a team. Like let's say one of them is you know offense one of them is defense and the other one is uh you know the um the sort of uh, the caring system or the repair system you need all three to have that ultimate voltron right you know you know, a attack without defense is nothing without a repair system and a and a self-regulatory system is nothing so i think it is that perfect combination combine them far more powerful than each of them on their own so good 
Number 13. Yes, sir. Tell us about an industry challenge that felt like solving a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. <laughs> um, I, one of the industry challenges that we've solved recently, and, and I, I wish we'd solved it for all, you know, all, everybody in the industry, but we solved it for a specific client, is the challenge in the, uh, uh, the consumer goods market of warehousing, right? Right. You, you know, if, if you think of any company, be it Amazon to, to, you know, Unilever to anyone who produces products, obviously their ideal is to have no warehouses, uh, you know, get your product straight out to clients. Warehouses cost money. They add complexity. Now we were working with a client who had a lot of warehouses and every year the costs went up and the number of warehouses they need to get up and they, um, no matter what they did, they couldn't get that down. They thought it was a, a forecasting problem. So they invested tens of millions of dollars in a new in a new uh, IT system, didn't solve it. They then thought it was a process problem. So they invested tens of millions of dollars fixing processes. How do we didn't fix it? And then we got involved through a casual conversation with one of the bosses over. And I said, explain to me what's happening. And then I said, once he explained, I said, do you know what? The problem is a conversation is faulty in your company. And the guy looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, by the sounds of it, two teams have to meet every month and agree a number of products to make for each. And they, this is happening all over your business. For each product, they have to agree a number. And the two teams are, one is the team that produce it, the supply chain team, and the other team is the team that sell it. And those are two different personality types. One is very conservative, yeah, very engineering based, very technical. The other is very confident. They're a salesperson. So what happens when these two people meet? The conservative person says, we only need to make 100 products. The, the aggressive risk taker says, we need to make 1,000 products. So they always, and that because that aggressive, confident person is more dominant in the conversation, they make 1,000 products. That's 900 extra products they have to store every month. That's where the warehousing problem was coming. But nobody, nobody looked to investigate the conversations, the meetings. <clears throat> we came in, we fixed that. You know what? The number came straight down after a couple of months. Number 14. Yes. How do you ensure your strategies fit a company like a tailored suit? Well, uh, we spend time at the outset <clears throat> taking all the measurements, cool. right? We don't cut anything until we are certain not only their size <laughs> and it's not going to change, but also their preference on all the, uh, you know, on the style, the color, the fabric, right? And if they're unsure or they debate, we'll say, it's okay. We'll give you the space. We'll give you the time to, to, to define this. Because what we call in our world, problem definition is the single most important part of having a successful strategy. If you do not know what you want to achieve or what problem you're tackling, don't start developing a strategy. Spend time there. That's far more important. So take more measurements, explore your preferences, and then it'll be easy making the suit. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say something really quick. Uh, I did not give him these questions up front. So I'm like, I'm, I'm in awe of how well you are just like, you're, you just absorb. I mean, I, wow. Okay. Anyway, number 15. Yes. If FQ were a fitness regimen. Yes. How would it whip strategies into shape? Okay. Uh, it would. Do you know FQ is the is your secret best partner, and it can't be the uh, army major, you know, the drill sergeant. It can't be the guy who shouts at you, "Come on, get!" Right? It will be the ultimate um, fitness uh, supporter because it's the kind of supporter who will have laid out your gym shoes already, mm -hmm. will have already booked your gym session, right? Will already have laid out your banana and your electrolytes. Right. So it's removing every excuse you would potentially throw up of why you can't go to the gym. Right. That's what FQ does. It makes it as smooth as possible to just become a habit to just be, you see the path and you don't have any distractions. That's the that's the gym partner you want, the gym, the PT. In all fairness, um, I did not know anything about FQ until yeah. you. I've gone through EQ trainings and trainings and trainings and trainings and obviously worked to build my IQ. The area that I lack most is FQ. And the more you talk, the more I understand this. And 
I'm one of those people that once I'm aware of something, um, then I get to do something about it. And so I'm in, I'm deeply inspired. I, I want to say that before we get into 16. Thank you for what you're you. sharing. I'm learning a lot. Uh, number 16. <clears throat> what's the biggest iq versus eq versus fq showdown you've seen and how did shia ghetto referee <laughs> um, do you know what uh i think a big one uh is um and i've seen this a couple of times is is around uh prioritization and rationalization so what do i mean by that so many times when we work with companies and I, I say to them just casually, how many strategic projects are you doing right now? Right? And I remember the first time I did this, it was a company that had 40 employees, Joshua. And the CEO looked, turned around and said to me, in all seriousness, we have 150 strategic projects at the moment for us. And I said, wow, that's more than one per employee. That's actually more than three per employee. I was like, how can you have 150 things that you call strategically important at the same time? And he took me through all 150, like, oh, we're doing project A for this reason, like this logical reason. We're doing project B for this. So lots of IQ, why all these projects came up. But no FQ, right? No human being can work on 150 things simultaneously. No. And when I explored it, a lot of the problem was the EQ side of, you know, 10 of the projects the CEO himself was sponsoring had come up with. He didn't want to let go of them because they were personal projects. They were, they, you know, they were part of his ego, part of it. The same with the CFO. The same with the the uh, head of marketing the head of right so it was like how do we help them get more focus and overcome this emotional barrier like so they don't feel like they're stepping backwards and being less of a leader mm -hmm. and do you know what the answer was <clears throat> what we played pokemon in the boardroom really? yeah we turned it into a game right what i did is i took all those 150 projects and i turned them into pokemon cards i don't know if you've ever played pokemon cards right no. but fundamentally you get a card that tells you who your pokemon is and what their different uh characteristics and their skill scores are right and you kind of play two cards against each other whoever whoever has the highest score in a category wins so we turned each of these cards into each of these projects into a card and they played pokemon and some cards just kept losing time and time again and they get frustrated and i said do you know how you can get rid of your frustration get rid of the card it's a shitty card hmm. right? so it gave them a legitimate reason to say okay we'll get rid of that one and by after playing for two hours, we got down from 150 to 30. Right? They let go emotionally of 120 projects. Right? So we had kept the IQ, we'd given them more FQ, right? And we'd done it through EQ and reframing how they felt emotionally about each of those projects. Again, such a just so timely about surrendering what no longer serves us. The silly things that we hang on to thinking that we need or thinking are important. Golly, that is just very powerful. Thank you for that answer. Number 17, <clears throat> share a client story yep. where Shia Ghetto swooped in like a strategic superhero. I think uh, I think we've shared a few, right? It, it, and and Shia Ghetto isn't the superhero of every story. Okay? Um, yeah, you know, yeah, I can tell you loads of stuff we did last minute, you know, come in. But I think some of the most powerful stuff um, comes from the clients themselves, right? We have one client that is so self-aware, they ask me or a member of my team to join their board meetings every month just to call out bad behavior and biases. And I think I think that is so uh so amazing to even think to do that to say do you know what we don't it's not we don't trust ourselves but we know that sometimes we get a bit extravagant sometimes we sideline somebody in a meeting sometimes we say stuff that isn't based on fact having just someone who's independent in the room who who knows how to look out for these things is the best investment of our time and money and it's a real privilege to work with them and some some months we say very little because they're operating well but some months we have to step in and say Guys, you're about guys, ladies, gentlemen, you're about to make a terrible decision. And here's why. Right. So uh, and for me, they're the superhero in this story by allowing us in that room. 
one of the things that I'm really appreciating about you is because there is some serious levels to your genius and your your levels of mastery uh, are evident, but you definitely have a way of not making it about you that I admire a lot. And having always looked to try to be a better leader and, you know, over the last seven, eight years is when I've really dedicated my life to working hard to be a great leader. One of the struggles has been you know, letting ego step in. Um, ego, I shared this uh, when I was a, an evangelist. Um, there was like religious competition of who could be holier and who had more of the Holy Spirit, you know, like things like that. And and egos in that. And and then all of a sudden, you're the, the place that we're to do things from, from our heart. And when we serve, when we love, when we try to assist and support our fellow man, we can't really do that to the best of our ability when ego is present. And I really admire how you've really taken ego out of your work and your way of being and what you teach and how you advise. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. Um, question 18. Yes, sir. If your strategies were fortresses, okay. yep. what would be their impenetrable defenses? Uh, I think, you know, as we do with all clients, you know, something we do for ourselves and what I massively advocate is imagine your fortress has been penetrated, right? Start off with the assumption that you have been overrun. Okay. So this, this allows you two things. It liberates you. Instead of, it liberates you to A, explore why that might have happened, right? And when you explore that, explore everything from, do you know what? It might have been that the gate was left open to, do you know what? A mouse might have come in and the mouse had a bulldozer on his back and, you know, he opened the gate or whatever. Right? So you find even the most obscure stuff and then you can work through them. But the other thing is it puts you in the mind of let's imagine the worst case that the people have been let it, you know, the fortress has been invaded. How do we deal with that? Yeah. Let's come up with some great ideas. So not only would I look to find, I'd also look to how could we how could we do? And it might be the answer is let them in, befriend everyone. Right. Maybe it's never as bad as you think it is. And those are two techniques I use with a lot of clients. The first is called a pre-mortem. Let's imagine the worst has happened and try and identify why. And the second is called, you know, strategic uh, stress testing. Let's imagine the worst case. What do we do then? Because even if that doesn't happen, at least we'll have done the thinking and it's better to do the thinking in advance than when we're under a stressful situation. Such a great answer. Number 19. Wow, this is going by way quicker than I thought. Um, number 19. <clears throat> How has your diverse background turned yeah. you into a strategic Swiss army knife? Yeah. Uh, I, it's a bit like uh, when we talked about the Avengers earlier. I wasn't aware that all the things I was doing would make me such a good strategist. Um, if I'm, you know, and, and I'm still got a long way to go, right? You know, never believe someone when they tell you they're the finished article. Now, just for context, my my philosophy in life is to be like an actor in the 1920s, right? Before CGI, before special effects. If you were an actor in the 1920s, if you had to ride a horse, you had to learn how to ride a horse, right? If you had to fight with a sword in a scene, you had to learn how to fight with a sword, right? If you had a Right. So I've always taken the view, learn a little of everything because you never know how you might need it later on in life. And that's been my attitude to why I was a teacher. And then I worked in industry. It's why I've lived in uh, seven different countries. Right. Wow. It's why I've I've always I've got a mantra, run towards the wrecking ball, try new things, you know, and these it is the combination of that mantra, that attitude that has given me all the ability to be more strategic and think through things from a different range of angles. So good. So good. Uh, number 20. What's the most heartwarming aha moment you've experienced with a client? Well, Joshua, I guess it depends how you define client. Um, you know, for me, back when I was a high school teacher, the kids were clients, right? If you look at it that way. And I remember the first time I had a kid who just didn't get it. All right. And I've had kids who didn't get it because they didn't want to get it. They'd sit there and tell you, I don't I don't like this. Right. I, I hate this subject. And I used to teach math. That was very common. 
But then you had other kids who who couldn't, get, you know, found it really difficult to get it. And I was living and working in a one of the first schools I taught in was a little village school in the Himalayas in, in Nepal. And for those kids, getting it or not getting it was the difference between a life as a farmer and potentially a life getting away from the farms and opportunity. So I remember that first kid that I helped, you know, get over that barrier of, I don't get this, you know, um, and I could see that once they got it, their life would be different. They didn't appreciate it at the age of 10, but it was for me, it was that beautiful aha moment of seeing a client get something. And that's, I still get that today, obviously not to that extent uh, or in different circumstances. It's in the boardrooms, it's with people. But when you see that moment where you know things are going to be different now, that is such a beautiful aha moment. So wonderful. The last and final question. <clears throat> and I'm really, really grateful for the sincerity of all your answers. I really am. Uh, number 21. Yeah. If she, she had talked, she, <laughs> If Shia Ghetto's vision were a constellation, which stars would form it? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I can't. First of all, I can't believe we're on twenty-one already, right? It feels like we're only on number two. I know. Uh, and you've just asked me a question, which is going to highlight my limited knowledge of the star uh, constellations. But that's okay. I'm a Star Trek fan, so I'll just make up. Uh, and Probably. I'm a Star Wars fan. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, what are the constellations it would involve? It would involve a nice mix of constellations, both from our solar system, our, our galaxy, and other uh, galaxies, right? Because I think we're all the stronger for letting the light in from more places, right? More stars rather than less stars, right? Uh, and more variety of stars is the constellation that I would like to cultivate. So. I don't know their specific names, you know, it can uh, talk about the bear and the uh, the archer and all those things. But, uh, you know, let's bring together a diverse set of stars and then we'll all be grateful for the light that that shines. <laughs> I tried to throw a curveball and you still answered it and handled it masterfully. It's something about just being prepared. You do the work every day. So you're prepared for things like this. And again, these are some different questions with challenging different ways to make your mind work. And you've answered and handled all of them so beautifully without breaking a sweat. In fact, I think I sweat more asking the questions uh, <laughs> than, than you did having to answer them. So Ferris, I am honored by your presence today, your authenticity and your answers. And I would love for you to have the final word to close out this broadcast, but make sure that you plug where people can find you, where they can support you, where they can buy your courses, coaching, anything that you have, the yeah. floor is yours to close us out. Thank you very much, Joshua. And it's been a real pleasure to be with you today as well. And look, I'm gonna keep it simple for everyone, right? Come and continue the conversation with me, all right? You can do it in one or two places. Come and check out Sheer Ghetto, all right? And just for everyone's benefit, this is Sheer Ghetto. This is the logo, this is the name, this is how you spell it. This is a pillow made by my mother. Right, that's uh, moms are amazing. Moms are amazing. So sheer ghetto, the Japanese word for a sharpening stone. Or come and find me, Faris Aranki, on LinkedIn. All right, I post every day. I reply to every message I get. I just love chatting. And yeah, through those two channels, you can see the courses we offer. You can see there's a free assessment tool to see how strategic you are and how successful you'll be in whatever you're trying to achieve. Uh, but just generally, come and come and say hi, uh, and we can carry on the conversation there. Ferris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So good. So good. Uh, number 20. What's the most heartwarming aha moment you've experienced with a client? Well, Joshua, I guess it depends how you define client. Um, you know, for me, back when I was a high school teacher, the kids were clients right if you look at it that way and i remember the first time i had a kid who just didn't get it all right and mm -hmm. i've had kids who didn't get it because they didn't want to get it they'd sit there and tell you i don't i don't like this right i i hate this subject and i used to teach math that was very common but then you had other kids who who couldn't get, you know found it really difficult to get it and i was living and working in a one of the first schools i taught in was a little village school in the himalayas in in nepal 
And for those kids, getting it or not getting it was the difference between a life as a farmer and potentially a life getting away from the farms and opportunity. So I remember that first kid that I helped, you know, get over that barrier of, I don't get this, you know, um, and I could see that once they got it, their life would be different. They didn't appreciate it at the age of 10, but it was, for me, it was that beautiful aha moment of seeing a client get something and that's i still get that today obviously not to that extent uh, or in different circumstances it's in the boardrooms it's with people but when you see that moment where you know things are going to be different now that is such a beautiful aha moment so wonderful the last and final question mm -hmm. and i'm really really grateful for the sincerity of all your answers i really am uh number 21 yeah if she, she had talked she had, if Shia Ghetto's vision were a constellation, which stars would form it? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I can't. First of all, I can't believe we're on twenty-one already, right? It feels like we're only on number two. I know. Uh, and you've just asked me a question, which is going to highlight my limited knowledge of the star uh, constellations. But that's okay. I'm a Star Trek fan, so I'll just make up. Uh, and Perfect. I'm a Star Wars fan. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, what are the constellations it would involve? It would involve a nice mix of constellations, both from our solar system, our, our galaxy, and other uh, galaxies, right? Because I think we're all the stronger for letting the light in from more places, right? More stars rather than less stars, right? Uh, and more variety of stars is the constellation that I would like to cultivate. So. I don't know their specific names, you know, it can uh, talk about the bear and the uh, the archer and all those things. But, uh, you know, let's bring together a diverse set of stars and then we'll all be grateful for the light that that shines. <laughs> I tried to throw a curveball and you still answered it and handled it masterfully. It's something about just being prepared. You do the work every day. So you're prepared for things like this. And again, these are some different questions with challenging different ways to make your mind work. And you've answered and handled all of them so beautifully without breaking a sweat. In fact, I think I sweat more asking the questions uh, <laughs> than, than you did having to answer them. So Ferris, I am honored by your presence today, your authenticity and your answers. And I would love for you to have the final word to close out this broadcast, but make sure that you plug where people can find you, where they can support you, where they can buy your courses, coaching, anything that you have, the yeah. floor is yours to close us out. Thank you very much, Joshua. And it's been a real pleasure to be with you today as well. And look, I'm going to keep it simple for everyone, right? Come and continue the conversation with me, all right? You can do it in one or two places. Come and check out Sheer Ghetto, all right? And just for everyone's benefit, this is Sheer Ghetto. This is the logo. This is the name. This is how you spell it. This is a pillow made by my mother. Right. That's uh, moms are amazing. Moms are amazing. So sheer ghetto, the Japanese word for a sharpening stone or come and find me, Farah Saranki on LinkedIn. All right. I post every day. I reply to every message I get. I just love chatting. And yeah, through those two channels, you can see the courses we offer. You can see there's a free assessment tool to see how strategic you are and how successful you'll be in whatever you're trying to achieve. Uh, but just generally come and come and say hi uh, and we can carry on the conversation there. Ferris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.